watching Morning at NTV. I'm glad you're still with us here on Morning at NTV. Time now to, to transition into our discussions on uh, topical issues of uh, the day. And uh, we come to you on a matter that uh, has uh, uh, completely uh, toppled uh, the stance and opinion especially with regard to matters Palestine and Israel. Over the weekend there was a bit of uh, banter, uh, some people were outraged, others were shocked, others were pensive regarding a decision that was uh, taken on Friday. But here is our preamble on Friday. The world's eyes were firmly on The Hague as the International Court of Justice issued its ruling on provisional measures in the case of South Africa that was brought against the State of Israel for violation of the Genocide Convention. The provisions that were issued by the court were six in total and the controversy that has Uganda in the eye of the storm, so to speak, regards the dissenting view or opinion by our very own Julia Sebutinde. That is uh, the judge who is one of uh, 16 at the court and she had a dissenting view or disagreed with entirely the whole <laughs> provisional measures that were uh, brought by the court. There's a lot that we need to chew on on that, but first let me introduce my guests who are going to help us understand was Julia Sebutinde's opinion erroneous or was it rooted in fact and the fact that she's not actually supposed to think about what Uganda thinks or its own stand with regard to the Israel-Palestinian question, we should cut her some slack. God Batum Shabe is a seasoned political analyst, a commentator, and one who should be able to help us understand these matters. He's joined on set by George Musisi, a lawyer and has some leanings, I must say, with the National Unity <laughs> Platform. <laughs> Gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. So these days, I don't want to say he belongs to that part. Because yeah. you might, yeah. for example, in the process of discussion, realize that there is a bit of dissenting opinion too in there. So, so, so good, there's not leaning. Yeah. You know, is there a line there? Yeah. 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 God by his coffee leaning. Yeah, yeah man, I'm aligned. I am not to you guys. Gentlemen, <laughs> thank you for making it. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. just give me your first and foremost, what, how you perceived or how you received, everyone received the news in different ways, especially in light of the dissenting opinion, but what was your take initially? Uh, well, um, uh, first of all, it, it, it's within uh, her right as a judge. It's mm. within her uh, to make uh, a decision. Yeah. Uh, what we call when we are fighting for independence, uh, including decision independence, means that uh, a judge should be able to make a decision irrespective of any leaning. So That's right. people who are criticizing on the basis of saying Uganda stand, I think uh, they are out of order. Mm. Uh, she should have every right to make a decision depending on the facts and the law that are uh, before her. Mm. Second, of course, after a judge makes a decision, it can be critiqued and, right. and uh, sure. it can be discussed, it can be critiqued. Uh, of course, she seemed to suggest that the, the, the dispute at hand mm -hmm. is a political one which should be negotiated either uh, through mediation or through mm -hmm. politics and mm -hmm. should not be a matter of courts. Of course we should remember that what the court was deciding on was were provisional measures. That's right. Uh, and then court, the, the presiding judge initially said that court is acutely aware of the grave human, ra human tragedy that the conflict has brought. Mm -hmm. I think that is instructive, the statement is instructive that mm. it, it, this was not a final settlement. That's right. It was uh, provisional measures to, uh, and after saying you are aware of the grave human tragedy as mm. court, then what next? And th we all even uh, find these issues even in our local courts that some of us believe that court should never close its doors to a person seeking a remedy. Mm. Court should always provide a remedy. In any case, when politics 
uh, politicians are disputing, mm. we run to court That's for a solution. Right. Mm. So by court saying that, no, you go back and settle uh, whatever you have elsewhere, I think it's, it's uh, in our opinion, uh, erroneous. Mm. It's court closing its eyes to a person who is seeking a remedy and does. And then the question is, if politicians fail to find a settlement, where do they go? Mm. So ordinary should be court. So uh, mm. we think that... Uh, uh, the decision was wrong, mm -hmm. uh, uh, basing on that political doctrine to say that no, even the provisional measures when there is that this what we've called an acute human tragedy, mm -hmm. we cannot help you go back and find a settlement. Which I'm sure the judge would be in, in, uh, instructive to know that this political settlement or negotiation is not going to come at least in the interim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, the provisional measures coming on the backdrop of what you say, the urgent need, for example, for the situation mm -hmm. not to go into the risk of irreparable harm mm. on the account of the people of uh, Palestine and uh, <coughs> Gaza. When you listen to the Gaza story, for those that have followed it, this is the largest <laughs> human prison mm. in the world where yeah. people do not step out. Mm. Whatever goes to them mm. is rationed mm. by the Israeli government. Mm. When, how, and for a judge, for example, not to be a tenant to that mm -hmm. and want to ease, for example, especially the, the receipt of humanitarian aid is a bit baffling because yeah. she was more like, it's okay, <laughs> let them die, <laughs> you know. But that is yeah. not exactly what she said. I'm only yeah. trying to, this is uh, some kind of opinion and opinion can be skewed at any yeah, one point sure. in time. Oh, good, but yeah. what was your take? No, they uh, actually found the, the entire decision by Justice Septimia quite buffering, eh? mm. in the sense that uh, just to help our 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 viewers understand the the context. The context, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, um, the, the 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 International Court of Justice and other international tribunals mm. are called upon to uh, to apply rules of international law mm. to address different situations. Mm. Now, the, the main, the, the basic framework for the application of these rules is contained in Article 38 of the international of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, the Article 38 outlines the four major sources of law that you apply: customary international law, mm -hmm. um, uh, treaties and conventions, mm -hmm. general principles of law, and then what we call judicial decisions and and uh, and uh, publications of renowned publicists. Mm. Now, we'd, sometimes we extend that, and you can also look for the what we call subsidiary sources. Mm. So when you cite like the UN General Assembly resolutions on on the conflict, these are we call them subsidiary sources. Mm. Now, the uh, the fact that there is a genocide convention, which was uh, remember that the genocide convention was uh, was uh, adopted in 1948 mm. it's part of the post war settlement that's right yes after the the, the after the um the the holocaust you know the world was uh, was really uh, perturbed by what had what happened, happened eh? yeah. and said no this should <laughs> not happen again so there is the genocide convention the uh, the, the crime of genocide is one of those crimes that in international law we call we call them we call them preemptory norms. Mm. Yeah, these are norms which you cannot derogate from. That's right. Uh, so there's uh, there's the crime of genocide, uh, prohibition of slavery. These are called preemptory norms, and you can't even enact a treaty mm. that try to legalize such a, a norm. If you did, the provisions of that treaty to that extent would be null and void. Mm. So. I was kind of like uh, disturbed by uh, Justice Septimia's ruling, basically saying, oh, so I, I have to limit my, my reasoning within the framework of the Genocide Convention mm -hmm. because that is the basis upon which the, the reference had been brought. Mm. But you, 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 we also know that uh, uh, the, these, these uh, preemptory norms the, the, there's a term which we use called the ega omnes. Mm. Ega omnes means that these norms apply to every state. These are rights and duties that apply to all states. Mm. So in other words, even if you were not a party to a convention, actually you derive rights and duties. As long as you're a member as, of the as, greater international Exactly, community. because those, those rights and duties apply generally. That's right. So 
uh, I think that the the the, the error in the, in Justice Septuagint's judgment for me for me was to basically look at this as a political dispute. Mm. Uh, and try to almost say that the legal principles do not apply. Mm. Uh, when you go to international law, almost every every international conflict mm. is a political, political conflict. A political conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult yeah. to make a very definitive distinction yeah. between international law, uh, international humanitarian law, mm. and sometimes public relations. Mm. So they, they are all intertwined. So they really the the fineness of the of the of the ICJ, the judges at the ICJ is to be able to, to break through that and be able to find the, the spaces to provide protection mm. for the parties that are, that are experiencing, that are seeking redress. Okay. Uh, and I think, uh, and, and she, she, she really, uh, she, she cites uh, correctly the, 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 the Yugoslavia uh, genocide cases. Mm. Um, that's 1996. That's right. Where, where principles, the general principles of law, as where the principle of uh, prevention of uh, genocide was actually articulated very clearly mm. as falling within those principles that uh, that should not be derogated from. Mm. So I think that I, I, the, the other thing that really struck me was even voting against the provisional measure for provision of aid. Mm. Yeah. to people who are suffering. Of course, uh, for and, purposes and of, uh, mm. let me just uh, bring yeah. our audiences mm. up to speed with uh, yeah. the, the gist of the provisions. Mm. Provision number one was to yeah. take measures to prevent the uh, commission of acts, all acts mm. prohibited by the Genocide Convention. And in this particular one, 15 judges uh, voted uh, in favor as in this should be done. And then Justice Julia Sebutinde and the Israeli judge Ahlak Barak, Ahlon Barak, also say <coughs> no. I think that one is uh, one of two uh, that uh, he sided with uh, Julia. Two, provision two was to ensure with immediate effect that uh, the Israeli forces do not commit any of the prohibited acts. Mm -hmm. In other words, tell the Israeli forces mm -hmm. not to embark on acts mm -hmm. that would be uh, uh, be tantamount to prohibited acts. She says, mm -mm, we don't have to put the Israeli <laughs> yeah. forces <laughs> and of course what makes it uh, you know, <laughs> on the spot on that, let yeah. them do what they want. Yeah. That's ideally what she said. Mm. What makes it even more ironic uh, for the benefit of our viewers, mm. uh, the court has 15 judges and yes. then the parties in dispute appoint what they call ad hoc judges. Ad hoc judges yeah. Yeah. So, so that one of the, the, the Israeli appointed judge voted on some of the provisions mm -hmm. uh, uh, but further what good was saying that the reason why people go to <laughs> court mm. is because they have a dispute yeah, yeah. and for mm -hmm. nations many times the dispute will be political mm. and the political measures have failed and they have failed yeah. and and of course these are provisional <laughs> measures interim yeah. measures yes where you know that there will not be a political solution in at least yeah. in the interim mm. yes and That's then right. we look at that court the international court of justice as one which is to set precedent, mm. global precedent. So the, the, the duty of that court is, is, is put on such a high pedestal mm. that it's setting up international precedent. Even when sometimes some of its judgments may not be self-enforcing because mm. of enforcement mechanisms, mm. but at least you set the precedent. So it was a drawback mm. on some of people who believe in international order that you can have this judgment, this is opinion. Whereas it's, it's a dissenting, but can be cited. Mm. Uh, God knows that sometimes we have uh, such cases, we've even had some cases here locally where a judge goes for the political the, that political line that this mm -hmm. should not be inquired into yeah. mm -hmm. and then you'll find so many people yeah. citing it for future reference Absolutely. would I be off the mark if I compared this to a ruling that many of us have become accustomed to where we are told that there were malpractices mm -hmm. in this particular mm -hmm. exercise yeah. but they are not sufficient enough to cause mm -hmm. any significant uh, impact on the yeah. final so Let's just dismiss that. Mm. Actually, that's some of the commentaries. The, mm. Some of the commentaries are that, okay, Uganda has historically, mm. uh, the Ugandan courts have historically tried to apply what we call the political question doctrine. Political question doctrine. Yes. So in other words, the judges are reluctant mm. to, to inquire into matters of a political nature.
and yet that is where the crisis the, normally is yeah. even for uganda here the crisis <laughs> the crisis for uganda is more political than legal mm. that you cannot most of our problems you can't solve them legally mm. you actually solve them politically mm. and yet and yet the, the the principles of law actually allow the judges to do that yeah uh if if they are, if the ugandan judges were the ones presiding over the case of uh, uh, Uhuru and uh, and Raira in mm. Kenya. Mm. Most likely they would have invoked the political question doctrine. Mm. So you would not have that court narrow the, the, the announced results of the election even if they thought they were illegal. Mm. So that, that's really the point that now is being made that uh, Justice Sebutinde basically almost imports the political question doctrine mm. into the ICJ. Okay. And and so when you look at um, uh, first of all, uh, he ra she raises questions that South Africa is not part of the conflict. That is right. So she, uh, it's South Africa is calling upon two parties uh, to uh, to uh, to, uh, to put in place certain measures, and there is no way. Hamas can put in those measures. So in other words, this is only being required of Israel. Mm. But that, that, I don't think that that should be her issue. But again, she appeared yeah. to, she appeared to mm. urge mm. South Africa yeah. uh, to use its good offices, apparently being a friend to Hamas, yeah. to prevail on Hamas to release, to release hostages. hostages. <laughs> Meaning yeah. she has opinion behind <laughs> that yeah, allows yeah. her yeah. to understand that this particular mm. conflict yeah. can actually be solved yeah. in that way. Yeah, no, I, I, th I th yeah, no, I think the point is the point mm. is that, as a matter of fact, yeah. I agree with her mm. that the the Palestinian question is a, a higher political question. That's right. You need you need men and women of good will mm. to be able to engage in good faith negotiations mm. on how to resolve the question. Mm. There is, I think there is another problem which you normally see in the commentaries. Everybody, there are many people who almost think that the trigger of the current war mm. was triggered on 6th of October mm. by the terrorist attack by Hamas. Which is very wrong. Which I think is yeah. very wrong. Yeah. And you, I are, think you are dealing with a conflict mm. that has been here for as many years as possible, yeah. where Palestinians have been confined in these in these uh, in these open prisons, yeah. is that something she yeah. had to put into consideration? And uh, could her decision be widely seen to be yeah. only considering seventh October? That's what I read from his mm, from, from her, her judgment yeah. that she's putting a lot of emphasis in, on October because you see mm. when you look at October sixth, seventh, seventh, sorry. Yeah. And you see that terrorist attack by Hamas. It's very annoying. Very annoying. It's very infuriating. Yeah. But then, yeah. the incidentally, you actually won't incidentally what no. people have failed, uh, most, what most powers have failed to uh, understand mm. is that weak, uh, the, the, means of, uh, the means of the oppressor, mm. the means of the oppressed mm. are determined by, by the, the means of, of the, the oppressor. oppressor. Mm. So if you, are, if you are Palestinians and you are facing a military power like Israel, mm. Mm. What are your options? Mm. Because uh, you, you know the Israeli will say, "Oh, these guys are throwing around bombs; they are terrorists." Mm. But what what is the what are the options of Palestinians mm. to yeah. fight with Israel? Mm. So, uh, so if someone understands mm. that there is already perpetual injustice being committed mm. against the Palestinians, mm. and there are different groups going to react very differently, mm. then you have to frame your even a decision like this one in the context of what is going on. Mm. So to look at October 7th mm. as, the, as the definition of what's going on, I think is to misleading. lose the point. So where do we go next? Mm. Does this hugely affect Julia Sebutinde's uh, career? <laughs> because at the end of the day, if another judge agreed with her on certain aspects, mm. it's important to know that, well, anybody can disagree and dissent. Mm. So there shouldn't be any effects or something she should be afraid of in terms of uh, destabilizing her career. Certainly she cannot lose her position at, at a court because mm. of a decision. Mm. Uh, she has the, 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 the discretion and independence mm. to make whatever decision. 
uh, but we should also know that uh, it's anchored uh, in politics. And yeah. it's also possible that had dissenting opinion was also anchored in politics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can't rule it out. Yes, you can't rule it out. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's possible that, uh, because you know judges are elected in uh, yeah. by the UN, so it's possible that her decision is anchored in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it will always be uh, a, a, a stab on her career uh, mm -hmm. every time you, the, the, because this is a conflict which has um, been there for ages, and this is one of the times that uh, it has come before the International Court uh, for arbitration. Of course, the longer term decision will, will take ages because the hearings yeah. of the, yeah, of the, is the uh, adjudication will take a longer, a long, longer time. Longer time. Uh, and that's why the anger mm. towards her is a lot that, you know, this was a preliminary measure. We're not mm. deciding whether there's genocide or not. Okay. Uh, you are just looking for provisional measures. And mm. so uh, certainly she, she, she will she will go down as, as uh, and it will be anchored in history that when the matter came for international adjudication, because mm. like I told you, we look at this court uh, as a star in setting global jurisprudence. Mm. Yes. So do we see a possibility, for example, very quickly as we go into the break, that she could pivot at any one point in time in uh, ahead of the adjudication or this particular stance could actually encumber her ability uh, to pivot, if that makes sense? My, my view is that it will, one, first of all, it wouldn't encumber her ability to pivot. Mm. Because you see, what the process that the court is going to go into now mm. is more of a fact finding. Okay. So they are, go, they are going to, these are, these are called preliminary measures. Mm. So they are going to go into fact finding uh, and therefore hear the case on the merits. All right. Yeah. I, I was actually also struck because I, I read through the, the entire submission by South Africa. Mm. One of the things that struck me was the fact that. The South Africa was able to articulate mm. the statements of Israeli officials, including the generals who have including the pre out. Increasing, increasing President Netanyahu. Yeah. Uh, so the executive right. arm, mm. the judicial arm, and the military arm. All of them talking about how they should almost eliminate. All right, the, gentlemen. Yeah, so in other words, if, if everybody stands in your way, uh -huh. uh, eliminate. And I'm like, okay, so if this is not, if this language does not amount to inciting intent. yeah is, <laughs> does not amount genocide. to intent yeah. uh to inciting what then would you call it interesting yeah. there when we return we shall of course uh, look into that including the fact that some of the israeli generals want the backbones of the palestinians broken when somebody wants that then <laughs> they don't want life for you whether that is actually intent to commit genocide remains to be seen we shall be back after the break country is uh, concerned. Those are stories that uh, we shall continue to follow and of course uh, give you the developments as and when they happen. Let me return to the studio and uh, continue with our discussion, our Kickstarter, the International Court of Justice ruling on a case that was brought before it by South Africa on Israel, against Israel rather, you know, with regard to violations of uh, the Genocide uh, Convention. Before we went for the break, I had with me a good Tom Shabe, a political analyst, and uh, George Mosesi, a lawyer. We've been now joined by uh, Yusuf Sibambi, another legal mind, and uh, one of uh, the... I'm actually comfortable to say that we are three lawyers on this panel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. No doubt about that. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'll be very remiss not to say that. Legal minds. Yeah. Welcome to the program. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. First of all, I'd like to apologize. I perfectly understand. I'm stuck mm -hmm. somewhere in a jam. Uh, good morning, viewers. And good morning, uh, the panelists and Ms. Tambide. Yes, we've uh, discussed uh, quite a lot with regard to the ruling that was uh, issued on Friday, but uh, our thrust is on uh, the misunderstanding, the controversy, the lack of understanding surrounding Julia Sevetinde's descent. What's your take very quickly before we continue with exactly where we were when you joined us? Uh, I think to most uh, lawyers, I would say, and the international community, people are shocked by the descending judgment of uh, Justice Sebutinde mm. as a person. Uh, we didn't expect that, given the measures that the South African team mm. sought to get in the interim. Uh, first of all, I don't think they really wanted to have 
an exhaustive discussion of whether there was a genocide or not. Mm -hmm. But at least they wanted the interim measures which are humanly possible mm -hmm. to avoid whatever's going on. Uh, I think close to 30,000 people have died That's right. uh, as a consequence of the bombing, mm -hmm. uh, either side, either Hamas or the Israelites. So I think what he did was sought is to have some bit of ceasefire mm. and control, uh, uh, food, and medicines, etc., etc. So the descending judgment actually was not really uh, morally right. And uh, for me and other, I don't know what my colleagues have really discussed here, but when you look at the international discussion, mm -hmm. Uganda now is in the limelight as if we, we are the people <laughs> who, who we, we agreed on, we, we agreed on the, of the ruling. That's yeah. why I think it is really yeah. good that we also have to yeah. give a position. That's right. Personally, as a lawyer, I think when you look at the judgment, I think she, she misfired. She addressed issues which should have been addressed later on, not about what was brought before the yeah. court. Mm, right. I, I think the court here is sought to have something uh, in the meantime, mm. uh, as you now look at whether there was a genocide, mm. who is right, who is not wrong, mm. what is the ultimate solution. Mm. Because she did want to talk about uh, these issues as if, as if it was a decision in finality. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really wrong. Uh, she's uh, an accomplished judge, but we have worked with her here. and. Mm. Uh, the lawyers here can testify. Uh, at times she becomes too sentimental and mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> fails to address <laughs> issues. But, but in yeah. terms of competence, yeah. I really have no, she's here. Yeah, yeah of course she is. As a judge. Given her work. Uh, yes, but when she gets to work, uh, mm. uh, this is a judge you would go to court mm. and even fear to address her because you don't know whether you put on a tie which is not right <laughs> and it becomes an issue. Uh, when you look at uh, all the probes she did here, she was doing a very good job. Mm. But she would now misfire by really being particular on, on a trivial matter. Uh, let me hope uh, this kind of uh, uh, passionate approach to issues d did not affect her judgment. I, I had a quick look at the judgment and uh, God by here is really more accomplished in that. Mm. She really failed to, 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 to appreciate international law mm. on she specific and, and she mm. became a little bit political. Mm. Uh, I, I don't want to say people are saying that you know, she's a, a staunch religious mm. somewhere and uh, would now feel that now, there's this feeling that uh, Maybe I, I hear for Jesus Christ to come back the entire is that it must be clear uh, because that, that, that one did not come out in the judgment. Yeah. It would be uh, wrong mm. for me to attribute such uh, uh, an accusation mm. uh, to, to, to an accomplished judge like uh, Julia Sebutinde. Okay. But uh, I think going forward, I would believe that uh, after that big, uh, <laughs> that, that, that wrong decision mm. where you actually, you, you were the only person dissenting out of 17, uh, <laughs> I think she really have to address that. Uh, there were aspects that another judge actually agreed with her. Do you find that judges? Yeah, but, but that's just again a judge who had a lot of pressure given the background. <laughs> he was appointed by Israel. He was appointed by Israel. So all wow. the other judges, and mm. if you look at the arguments that were raised by South African team, that's right. definitely any judge or yeah. any mm. lawyer would definitely give uh, direction towards allowing those measures mm. uh, whatever reasons that you have all right uh, just for a quick mm. add on apollo's point you yeah. know when you have uh, 17 judges mm. and you are one or two dissenting judges mm. then the dissenting judgment had better be solid solid okay. yeah they should uh, not yeah they have okay. they have to be solid the the legal reasoning mm. must go beyond reproach mm. okay yeah I, so I, don't that, yeah, I don't think that. I don't think that yes. uh, the the jury accepted as uh, legal <laughs> reasoning in her op in her dissenting mm. opinion actually goes beyond legal reproach. The, for, for like the, the for way instance, we want to, to saying see that it, yeah. you justify 
I would say justify mm -hmm. the, the killing of 26,000 people uh -huh. are here because they are mixed with, with yes. the Hamas yeah. and the, the legitimate targets, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. That, that uh, is really yeah, too political. Yeah, you know, like, like if, if terrorists came and were hiding in Mulago Hospital, mm -hmm. that it is, uh, yeah, that you can bomb mm -hmm. Mulago Hospital. Mm -hmm. Because there are some, maybe even if there were a thousand terrorists mm -hmm. there, I, I mean, it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a judge. Yet the use of human shields yes. is uh, yes. The use of a human used. shield is bad. Mm -hmm. It's bad, but but something that has been as the judge for, said that a country yes. has a legitimate right, right, mm. right to come and kill no, no. children, women in the hospital mm. for you to reach a thousand, a thousand terrorists. I think that is really taking it too far. Mm. So that, that's what I, I think it's okay to dissent all the time. Mm. We've, we read dissent, dissenting judgments even in law school. That is right. But uh, you read it because you are looking for that fineness mm. in terms of the legal reasoning that okay. comes uh, to the uh, actually dissenting judgment. Actually, there are times judgment. when a dissenting judgment is, 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 is Oh, it's actually like, yeah. the, it's yeah. actually, it's actually like the judgment <laughs> itself. Yeah. 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 In the age limit yeah. case here, uh -huh. I remember Justice Kakuru's dissent uh -huh. was yes. widely. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. every time you dissent, there's a, mm. there'll be a spotlight mm. shown on you. and yes. then. Uh, but of course, even the, what Honorable Yusuf was saying, mm. the, the, even the political question doctrine, uh, mm. international humanitarian law was anchored in politics mm. because people have political disputes. That's mm. right. So it's yeah. to regulate mm. political disputes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, very shortly, God, but you will help us on whether this particular uh, provision of measures are binding in any way or it's a case of uh, pressure that would work because of uh, the mm. fact that there is momentum to it yeah. to compel Israel to actually, yeah. for example, produce a report mm. as uh, was uh, stated. But let me first understand from uh, George Moses's point of view, mm. as recommended by uh, Yusuf Simambi, <laughs> the intent to commit genocide. As the case progresses to adjudication, mm. South Africa will be required to produce concrete evidence to demonstrate that mm. Israeli forces mm. have planned mm -hmm. and actually want to eliminate mm. in the nature that mm. is equal to genocide of the Palestinian people and those as, within as, Gaza. As, as described under the yeah, genocide as described, Is it yeah. possible for South Africa to do that? And because even the measures have required Israel to preserve evidence. Can mm. the forces preserve evidence mm. that would incriminate them? Uh, of course, like Kodba Arya said, mm. genocide is one of those crimes which are abhorred internationally. That's right. And that cuts across the board because of its seriousness. Mm. And the next step for the court, the fact-finding mission, it's going to be a lengthy one. Mm. And of course, like every case when they are presenting facts and evidence, it's always a matter of... Uh, one about the other because then they will not contest mm. you can present fact a and then the other side, <laughs> f f side says no mm. fact is not as it is so it, mm. it's going to be a long and drawn out contest okay. but of course for south africa's case it has already made its mark uh, I think it, 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 it has, Im, the case has already raised its standing, no That's matter right. where it goes. Mm. It has already its standing. Even the mere fact that, that uh, we have an international tribunal like ICJ mm. now examining this conflict. Yeah. And that's why uh, maybe even Justice Julius Dissent were looking at it because we're saying that it missed a mark because this conflict is now at this level where mm -hmm. we are saying we are bringing global precedents yeah. uh, and of course for South Africa has made its case, it's going to make its case in the next, uh, and of course in terms of international standing, mm. it has made its mark That's right. whether it will prove that will be th that can take years and years and we all know that even politics may come in mm. the international politics may come in and it's a matter of evidence but the international court now and we all know most of these uh, tribunals they don't have self-enforcing mechanisms but the mere fact that we are now at at, uh, at an adjudicating level mm. where a tribunal can look at these facts i think it's already a step forward okay mm. uh, good but when uh, uh council of Sisi speaks of uh, the lack of an enforcement mechanism mm. it brings me to the question of whether this can actually be binding or not but even if it is not binding mm. uh it kind of puts the United States and all the backers of mm. Israel on notice that hey, it is about time that you begin to think about what you say, mm. how you say, and what kind of support you offer Israel, especially within the public realm. Mm. So the all the work of international institutions is rooted in the UN Charter. Mm. The, 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 the United Nations Charter is like the, the it's like the primary instrument, the Bible, uh, the Bible of international law. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, in other words, the, when uh, whenever there is uh, there are international engagements, mm. there are certain expectations on the parties. That's why even when we are teaching the law of treaties, mm. 
uh, basically people, uh, student asks so why how does a small country like Uganda go and negotiate with the US and uh, Russia and China and we say no uh, the international is, is founded on a number of principles uh, state sovereignty uh, jurisdiction state responsibility mm. and every country once it's it's recognized once a state is recognized then it has the same standing like any other within the international legal system mm. now the once you engage in negotiations and you then in, in, enter into a treaty there is expectations on all the parties that you are all going to abide by the treaty in good faith it's actually called uh, the principle of good faith i think that should be article article 38 of the of the of the vienna convention on the law of treaties mm. or 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 pacts into entered into should be honored in good faith so the, that's the, the that's the basis of these kinds of rulings uh, now there is no like uh, like um, um, CC said there is no international mechanism for enforcement mm. in most cases where there are uh, big powers involved countries can impose sanctions in other cases you call diplomatic uh, you are diplomatic representatives mm. in terms of, uh, in form of protest but even when there are no clear enforcement mechanism the the uh, decisions of these tribunals are sub uh, they have a moral force mm. so in other words you as israel you should look bad that the entire it, an entire institution of the of the united nations the international court of justice mm -hmm. has said you are engaging in these violations mm. and you sign on this treaty mm. and you don't want to abide. Want to abide so in international law that's why we call this community of civilized nations mm. so in other words you are beginning you are beginning to act as if you are not part of the civilized nations so there is that moral force <laughs> yeah. that is supposed to be an additional enforcing mechanism for international law okay yeah Honorable Nsibambi, this particular case has thrust South Africa in a new light, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to how much muscle it can wield on the international scene. It offers countries like Uganda and many others in the global south <coughs> an opportunity to think, hey, we could also, at any one point in time, find ourselves, Spence. if we identify with some of the ideals elsewhere in the world that mm -hmm. are pertinent to us. When it comes to pursuance of justice across the globe the global south has tended to want to be respected when it uh, is actually not doing things that ought to earn respect do you see this as the beginning of that process yeah yeah before i give that comment i just want to also add a footnote mm. not good but say that of course uh, when you look at the decision of court Mm. It may not be enforced uh, uh, as such because right. the, the global powers maybe they are not interested and they will want to, to, to when it comes to the declaration as to whether it should be enforced or not, they expect the big powers to come in. Mm -hmm. But at least uh, the, 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 the decision put up something where at least you say that even Israel, given all the partners they have, other uh, organs can come in to say, please stop, mm. enough is enough. That's right. uh, but when it comes to what you are saying, I, I think for the first time, uh, this is not even an African decision, but a global mm. decision for the weaker uh, nations. Mm. Uh, at least that you can come up and say, mm. please, <laughs> we expected to have this from <laughs> the bigger uh, brothers, uh, America, Russia, uh, all that. But for the first time, a small country like South Africa coming up with this, when I think they brought this matter before the ICJ, I had a feeling that they had misfired. I expected to. <laughs> as I said, Nova BB2 was wrong. Why did they bring it without all the support yeah. of, of the big uh, mm. uh, you nations? Feared for them. Yeah, I, I feared for them. But yeah. the presentation itself was excellent, mm. it was stellar. And uh, e even the decision now it has given us also the feeling that we can also come in and say please stop mm -hmm. uh, no one expected after, after all, we are, uh, after all we, are, we are now cheering numb mm. <laughs> so I, I think that's a, a very good uh, step in, in that direction my only worry mm. is that now what if the other nations say no we are not proceeding to to enforce this 
uh, do we have another block where we can now be sitting and saying now okay the UN is doing this and then as, as small nations NAM all these other uh, formations so that we can now bring issues uh, of this kind mm -hmm. before before the the, the, the world stage mm -hmm. uh, uh, lastly on, on, on this particular issue uh, uh, fighting is still going on mm -hmm. One would have expected at least to have done a bit of uh, ceasefire, whether not pro formally declared. It shows that uh, uh, America, all these other backers of Israel, are not bothered by decisions of the international court unless they are actively involved. I think that must be addressed also mm -hmm. as well. Why should we continue subscribing to? to clubs, mm. I should say clubs, where, where actually you find now just a few nations are controlling mm -hmm. and you keep subscribing w without any uh, strong voice. Uh, okay, some of the reasons could uh, be down to the fact that we don't even, uh, we can't afford to galvanize ourselves in uh, concrete blocks. In concrete blocks, one voice. exactly. We are also very poor. Usually <laughs> a poor man doesn't speak, <laughs> especially when it comes to some of these meetings. And then in the process of wanting to be treated fairly, we do not embark on means mm -hmm. that offer confidence in whoever you want to treat you fairly. We're well, also committing some bit of yeah. minor genocide uh -huh. in our own countries yeah. and want now to depict ourselves Stuff as like if that. we are saints. Mm. So I think that's also a big problem. We are blackmailed as well. Mm. All right, gentlemen, as we enter the final bend of this discussion, I would like to give each of you a time to do a wrap. But most importantly, your views on how best I know this is a question that has been asked very many times. Can the Israeli-Palestine conflict come to an effective end? The two-state solution mm. is not acceptable on the part of Israel. Yeah. And I do not see anywhere that the United States will go beyond the rhetoric of saying, hey, it's possible, but Israel, you know. How can this be brought to an end? Let me begin with you. Of course, uh, it's a hard one, mm. uh, given the efforts that have gone in, uh, in, in in trying to resolve it. That's right. And of course, it would have to take leadership. Mm. Of, because even if we have these institutions, you, you, just in this conflict alone, we've seen the UN Secretary General almost lamenting. Mm. <laughs> His hands were tied. He's been <laughs> calling up. Uh, of course, so <laughs> if the UN cannot arbitrate mm. clearly, like we've seen, uh, it means that you have to take the bigger powers, and that is the U.S. to provide leadership to its brother, Israel. Mm -hmm. Whether that is possible, it's also another thing, because uh, U.S. policy towards Israel, I think, is also anchored in their history the and US. local politics, yeah, because right. I think there are over 7 million Jews in, in the U.S. The United States. Uh, so if because of the domestic uh, support, possibly, towards Israel, mm -hmm. uh, it will always have that, that, that ambivalent uh, brotherly put. So, so if there is no leadership on mm -hmm. the part of the bigger nations, uh, NAM, the 120 countries can give whatever statements, UN mm -hmm. can give whatever statements, but it would have to take leadership, mm -hmm. uh, because clearly Israel uh, uh, will not stop unless told to stop, or unless forced to stop. The question, who would force it? Interesting there. The Prime Minister has, for the last three months, failed to pick the Secretary General's calls. <laughs> Interesting there. <laughs> Goodbye, if you called me and I saw a missed call. <laughs> <laughs> call <laughs> <you> <laughs> <had a local laughs> but over the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a failure. Simply looks at... <laughs> there was a problem of oh. you picking calls here. We almost <laughs> went to lose his calling. No, I have nothing to say. How can yeah. this be I brought to an end? First of all, I believe that the, there will be no a resolution to that conflict. Mm in the absence of a two-state solution framework. Okay. So as long as Israel can, can co consistently and successfully resist the establishment of a Palestinian state, mm. the Palestinians will keep on fighting. Mm. They will fight whether they are in Gaza, whether they are in the West mm. Bank, whether they are even scattered all over the world. Across the because that, that's the nature of humanity. Mm. Uh, when it, uh, um, some of the matters that, you are dif that are difficult to, to, to dissolve in, uh, in international law are mm. the, the whole question of self-determination. Once that's a right. people have decided that they, they need a state of their own. It's very difficult to fight. Mm. Uh, secondly, I think that the, the only country that can really move that process is the United States. Mm. And, and I think that uh, uh, if the, this war 
and the human tragedy that has unfolded with it. Mm. Ordinarily, these are the kinds of tragedies that provide political momentum mm. to deal with very, very complex and controversial polit political problems like this one. Mm. Now, if the international community, which definitely would require the leadership of the United States, do not move mm. to be able to really push Israel uh, and say this a conflict has brought an end, then we are in this for a long haul. Mm. All right. Yeah. Honorable Sibambi. Yeah, just my take is like uh, uh, what, what my colleagues have just expressed here. Unless the U.S. takes uh, the forefront in resolving this matter, it will be very difficult to be resolved. The historical issues and the spiritual issues raised by either side mm. definitely must be addressed. So it is scientifically addressed. You cannot talk about that, you see, this land belongs to us as a holy land, and that cannot be justified in the circumstances. Mm. You have to agree that these two people have to coexist. Mm -hmm. You must have either uh, different states declared, but also it's a very difficult thing to to to. to to conspiralize at this stage. So I think we still have uh, a very big problem for, for, for some time, but the only person or entity that can address this is the US. Uh, then two, the other issue also of uh, uh, abject uh, poverty mm. uh, within the Gaza. I had the opportunity of visiting yes, the that place. Really the situation is mm. No, no, even the people. Mm. You'd find, actually, you find it the other side of whatever people are doing well, and then the other side of uh, uh, the Gaza specifically where the Palestinians are occupying. The it, southern it, part? The southern part yeah. is really not a very uh, good place to live in. So also that had to be addressed because people are manipulated uh, either side. There is survival on one side and the other people are a little bit mm. comfortable. Mm. And I don't know whether this is uh, systematically uh, organized to ensure that the conflict goes on mm. and gives a justification mm. for the U.S. also to have some bit control of the Middle East. Mm. So all those issues, maybe are issues which are mm. not raised in the ICJ, right. but those are political issues. Maybe giving an explanation of at least some slight justification of Julia's mm. uh, dissenting judgment mm. that the political issues mm. really have to be addressed squarely mm. uh, instead of just looking at the legalese. Mm. Mm. All right, interesting that Julia 17 day telling the world that hey, leave us alone, this issue must be taken care of. Mm -hmm. We have legal matters to deal with, no doubt about that. She has also, of course, uh, cemented her own position. Whether she will pivot, as we earlier said, or not, will depend on much of the evidence and uh, the developments ahead of uh, adjudication of uh, this no case. The Ugandan government came out mm. to, 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 to disown. <laughs> <laughs> no, ideally, I, I think, the, it, I think yeah. it was actually important. It was important because for the, the government. The, yeah, for, because yeah. I think the, the public took the, the, took the ICJ mm. like the UN. Mm. Mm. Like okay. the, when, when, a, yeah. when a representative is articulating things there, mm. is speaking on behalf of the government. The government. That's right. And yet the ICJ is completely different. No, I think no. it was important that the government of Uganda comes, comes out and, out and uh -huh. clarifies that. Mm. This is our position. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That was it was very really useful. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye, Tom Shabe. Many thanks for making time and many thanks to you too, Honorable Yusuf Nsibambi, as well as uh, George Masisi for the very enlightening insight <coughs> and emboldening perspective that you have offered us on the issue of the ruling and the provisional measures that were issued by the International Court of Justice. That will do it for this discussion, but do stay with us on Morning at NTV. My colleague Priscilla Regina Naloga will be coming up with the benefits of a circular economy on dealing with the challenges of climate change. That is one of the existential threats that the world is grappling with away from conflicts like Israel and Palestine.